Good evening, travelers of the night. Welcome back to The Stranger, where the immersion of an audio drama meets the chaos and uncertainty that is Dungeons and Dragons. Today, we are joined by Ari as Esperanza. Ready to join you with increasingly unhinged rage. Asteria as Dr. Isadora Glass. Putting the gal in Sven Galley. Matt as Inquisitor Nihilus von Stonen. Embrace the light within, for even the darkest shadows tremble in its presence. And Shane as Trevor. The heavily scarred superstar stuck in prison? How bizarre. Today we are also joined by Tom from the Emerald Collective, a D&D 5e and other storytelling group. Stick around after today's episode and we'll play a clip of their show. You can find all of their details and links to their show at thestrangerpod.com slash emeraldcollective. Tom, anything you'd like to say to our listeners? Tonight, there's going to be a jailbreak. Some of us may not survive. See, me and my brother don't like it here, and we're getting out, dead or alive. Ooh. So, all of that being said... Let's get into today's session. Esper, in the last session, you ran up to Sam Van Thorn, grabbed him by the shoulders, whipped him around and revealed his grotesquely scarred face. A scar that came not so long ago, but in the last season, when we set fire to the house of Lord Felix Royce with Sam in it as he was briskly carted away we then saw him again when Lady Evelyn Vanthorn took the party to a bunker to witness their execution, where Sam was having surgery done, perhaps to save him. You hear Dr. Glass behind you fall to the ground. You saw as she put her hand to her temple to read the thoughts of the area and something went terribly wrong as you hold Sam Van Thorn pinned to the door the door opens as if the latch just wasn't fully closed and it pushes inward and as you look past his scarred and mangled face in a large round room presumably the most important cell on this floor all you see is one Skull in the center. What the, what the, hell, the hell is this? What are you doing here? I, I, I. What, what are you doing here? What? Why? We're just here to get somebody. What is? What is this? It's. <laughs> it's. It's everything. It's everything they've done to us. Looking him in the face, how high is he right now? Please roll a medicine check with advantage. I'm gonna need that advantage. Natural 20 for a 19. A natural 20. You look at his pupils, and you know the look. Somebody who uses, but that's not what you see. Instead, you see, as the sweat perspirates from his wrinkled, scarred face, the shaking in his muscles, in his arms, the light shimmer. The look of ever-present pain He is heavily, 
heavily detoxing. In fact, he's probably experiencing some of the worst withdrawals. You see he's pale, besides what pink wrinkly flesh around his neck wherever it's not burned, and he's cold to the touch. Do they know that you're trying to take it? I'm... I'm not. I'm not. I'm... I'm not. Help us get what we want, and I'm not going to ask another question. Well, what what do you want? We're here for people. Two people. We know someone's down here. When the other is further up. We just want to get them and we want to leave. Yeah, yeah, just get whoever you want. I'm, I'm not here for them. And in this moment, that skull, it sits perfectly in the center of the room. Its hollowed eye holes are dark with the shadows cast on the inside. And somehow it's still looking at you. It it radiates tension in your direction. You feel it in your chest. You feel as your heartbeat beats hard. You can feel it hitting your chest with each beat. It's like you're having a panic attack is the closest thing. It's like Esper's attention can't remain on Sam. There's While they're talking to him, there's this constant move of their head to look back towards this skull. And eventually, just, just help us get to them and get them free, and then we'll bring you back here, and you can have... You can have your little, your body part, and we'll, we'll leave it at that. We won't bother you anymore. Just, yeah, just help us first. And, and help us first. It, it doesn't, it doesn't feel right. At this moment, I would like for you and everybody to roll a DC 22 wisdom saving throw. And by the way, at this moment, it's going to be with disadvantage. There is a way to roll this without disadvantage, but you don't know that right now. Esper has zero hope of making the DC. Let's see. Uh, I would need a 20. A disadvantage, so I need two 20s. Let's go. Let's go, baby. Natural one. Yes. Fuck's sakes. <laughs> Big eight. I. He actually had the highest chance. <laughs> I think. <laughs> 17. That's a three for Roland. That's a 14. Esper, as you look at Sam and back up to the skull, and then back down. You're holding Dr. Faust. Esper, what are you doing? There's a moment hung in the air between them. Esper, put me down. One hand is moving off of the uh, the coat into her pocket. She is crushing open the capsule of a full dose glass vial of slow ether, and she is going to jam it to his mouth. You jam it into his mouth, releasing the entire dose as you look up, and you're not in a hallway in a prison. You're in a small white room. And there's a door behind him that's open with two nurses standing. They look like they're not sure what to do with this hostage as you force this entire dose. Esper, no, no, no. Shut up, shut up. All of it. Esper, no. As he looks up at you and... You get lost in his 
menacing eyes. And it's like a blink. You're tied to the bed. In the asylum. Faust standing in the doorway. And... In the other corner. Dr. Glass. Now, an above-table explanation. When we play our characters in somebody else's moment... I was going to ask that. Excellent. Until they succeed a wisdom-saving throw, you are the worst version that they see you as. Esper, I would like for you to explain to us why you hate Dr. Faust. Esper, having been somebody for 11 years who was a patient of an asylum that Dr. Faust came to be a resident at and Esper's primary doctor, found that not only did he not listen to her, he did not regard her, he did not take into account her own perspective of the things that were wrong with her. But he borderline delighted using Esper as a test subject for his homemade medicines. The things that he augmented, for better or for worse. And he kept Esper in a constant state of being drugged. A a what became a generally voluntary sort of uh, stay in an asylum it became Esther's prison. It didn't help her. It did nothing but harm her. And one of the greatest days of Esper's life was the day that she got to claw her way away from him. Trevor. From standing in this hallway, something happened. You're... Your presence of mind faded, and it's like you're standing behind a pane of glass. It's thick. Any attempt you make at punching it will do nothing. But you see Dr. Glass standing in the corner and Esper in the bed. The rest of the world around you is a dark void. As Dr. Faust takes a step forward... Yes, of course, we all have our... A little pet projects, uh, I understand completely. But what I want to talk about is what you can do for me, Dr. Faust. We are colleagues, after all. We get each other in ways that, you know, these simple folk just don't. Dr. Glass, I appreciate you bringing her to me. It's important she seeks my care, and I see you understand that better than anyone. Of course. I remember you took a particular interest in a particular patient. Yes, Mr. Broder. That's all I really care about, is getting him back in my... Well, I can say clutches to you, right? We can say clutches. And then she says a a word that Esper has never heard before that's five syllables that Esper can assume means clutches. I feel like that's too on the nose, Dr. Glass, but if you'd like to say clutches, we can. Yes, it's the only reason that I came to this island, and I've done a great deal of string pulling and shepherding to get myself and my associates here so that I could see Mr. Broder. It is one of my one of my greatest maneuvers, I must say. It took some doing. I really had to twist some arms. Frankly, even I'm impressed as he steps forward with a vial of slow ether that is three times the size of a normal one. He carries it with two hands. Don't even. Don't you. No. Don't you dare. Be sensible. Esper, it's. It's time for your medicine. No. No. Esper, when will you learn to just do what I say? She's going to attempt to break an arm out. Please roll athletics, Esper. 
As this is happening, Trevor, his hands are pressed up against the glass. Like, you can see his eyes are like... He is darting between things in the scene. Uh, You can hear him yelling out, Hey! Hey! And he's just gonna... You pound on the glass, and I'd like for you, Trevor, to roll an athletics check. Okay. That is a 23. As you hit the glass, you see a crack form in the center and begin propagating out towards the edges. Now, I want to clarify above table. There may be many ways to take care of this glass. It doesn't have to be athletics. And, Esper, what was that athletics check? 21. You flex with all of your might, pulling on the leather straps that bind your hands to the bed. And in one smooth motion... They both snap as your arms are released. Using the momentum right up, grabbing Dr. Falls by the coat, bringing him down and giving him a headbutt. Roll to hit. Oh, what do we call this? We call this an unarmed strike, I assume. That's a 26. You slam your head against Dr. Faust. And you've headbutt people before. It hurts, of course. But with a 26, you see as it caves the front of his face. Blood, cracking of bone, and holding this vial, this oversized massive vial, he falls to the ground as it shatters, pouring the liquid over the floor. And all you see in the room is Dr. Glass. That's all that... That's all that it was, wasn't it? I'm just a... I'm just a, a fucking... A trade. That's it. I'm, I'm currency to you. To, to try and get in here and get... Get... Get in line with that... <laughs> oh, dear. You're catching up. That's all any of us are to... Anyone, isn't it? But... You know doctors well enough by now. I think you've trusted me mostly the right amount. And now, brava, look at what you've done. You've slain the dragon, so... Really, you should be thanking me, don't you think? I would like you, Esper, to roll a wisdom saving throw before you respond. Now this is... Still with disadvantage. But, Trevor, you sense, since you hit the glass, a shift in the tension in the room, a slight release of pressure. The roll is a five. Feel free to respond to Dr. Glass. I'm going to reach down for the straps that are holding their legs. They're familiar with hospital straps. They know how to unbuckle them. Begin to get up from the table and stand. Oh dear, there are no doctors like me. And I'd rather say you owe me a hefty bill now, don't you think? With all I've just helped you accomplish? Would you like me to help you out of here as well? We could start a tab. If you couldn't tell, I think I've decided on how to deal with doctors like you. Doctors like you. Esper's going to leap from the bed and try and take Dr. Glass's cane. Please roll a contested athletics check. Dr. Glass, I'm sorry. I don't know if athletics is your strong suit. But given that it's the cane, which stat do I roll? I would use the other stat, not athletics. The cane stat? Yes, the cane stat. Um, so... So I will do half proficiency because bard... Oh, no, Asteria's doing that. <laughs> not again. 13. 19. 
Now, Esper, you're going to be successful. As Esper stands from the bed, she goes to grab the cane and take it from you. And using this other stat, do we see how Dr. Glass tries to resist? And it hums. Like all of her powers, it's more auditory than visual, but Esper would feel it. It would resonate with them specifically in their bones. And Dr. Glass's eyes, her green-gray eyes, are, are suddenly full of stars in a way that's hard to look away from. And there's a humming from the cane, but Esper is not stopped by that, obviously. Esper, you go from the bed, you grab onto the cane, and you feel that resistance, that psychic energy pushing at you as both of your hands on the cane for a moment you take your other hand and shove Dr. Glass off of it I am so sorry but in the act of taking the cane the intention was to bring it right back to Dr. Glass in a very unfriendly way Trevor you see as Esper goes to swing as that's about to happen uh, Trevor who's still behind the glass sees the crack is just sort of like now just trying to brute force push like he's looking around he's going Esper please please roll to yeah to yell for Esper's attention you could roll with your I could say you could either roll with your performance or your athletic stat I think both have an argument to be made your choice if given the choice I, I would probably take athletics 10 times out of 10. Oh, it's almost a 20. But uh, that is instead an 11. An 11. You yell and you, you hear me? feel I'm your here. words vibrating this glass in front of you. You see the cracks. They continue to propagate a little bit, but you didn't get through yet. As I'd like for you to roll to hit Esper. Oh god, <laughs> so bad. I'm so sorry. You're great. <laughs> uh, it's a 26. With a 26, you strike at Dr. Glass. And there's no roll for damage here, but you strike with such fervor that she's thrust back against the wall and you see her fall onto the ground as a team of nurses begins to rush in they're carrying all of the supplies you recognize well. The buckled white vest, the needles with the various sedatives. Like an army of soldiers, they begin to crowd the room before you as Dr. Glass, bleeding and scarred across your face with this hit, you're still conscious on the floor. You stupid girl. What did I ever even do to you? You don't know what you are. You don't know who you are. You'd rather crack my skull and find out. Esper is no longer paying attention to Dr. Glass. Esper has a weapon. And there are a lot of people now in this room. There are. Esper is not going to be tied down again. As, uh, he's shouting... Pounding on the glass, he looks, sees the nurses start to come in, sees Dr. Glass lying on the ground, and almost perhaps not thinking through it, perhaps just like in the dream logic kind of way of just like having something and wanting to do something with it, uh, he's going to reach into, he's going to reach uh, behind him and pull out the breamed revolver. And even though it's empty, he's just going to point it over uh, as quick as he can, cock the hammer back, and aim at one of the nurses and just pull the trigger. Interesting. Please roll to hit. It is a 19 to hit. You aim your revolver through the glass into one of the nurses. Though you know it's not loaded, when the hammer drops and the gun fires. The noise echoes from behind that glass. Esper, it's like you've just had your bell rung. You hear the sound of a gunshot as the bullet slams through the glass, shattering it as the nurses all on the other side of Esper are blown backward, 
slamming against the walls through the walls of the hospital, almost toppling the building in the process. And all you see, Esper, in this moment, as I'd like for you to roll a wisdom saving throw with advantage, is Trevor standing on the other end of the room. This is going to be nerve-wracking because Esper really does need a natural 20 to be able to make it. Come on. Come on. No. What is that roll? That's a 12. Okay. The nurses, they continue to pile in. Now the wall's destroyed. You see the hallway. And Trevor, you have entered the scene as the nurses continue to pile in. I'd like an athletics check from Esper for this fight. Oh boy. You can do this. This is your jam. Natural two for an eight. Oh. And Trevor, what are you doing? For a moment, he's surprised that anything even happened, seeing smoke start to pour from the gun's barrel. He is holding the side of his head in pain. He's never fired a gun before, and he's realizing just how loud it is, especially in such an enclosed space. Realizing that the space is now much closer than he thought, immediately tucks the gun back away. I'm here! I'm here! I'm here! And he's just gonna run full tilt and try and football tackle uh, one of the uh, nurses, at least trying to thin the herd somewhat. Please roll an athletics check. Damn. That's a 13. A 13 is enough. I think you can take a nurse. As Esper, you start to become overcome with these nurses. They pile towards you. They grab onto your arms, your legs. You feel like you're in the middle of a crowd that's all tugging at you. And suddenly... Trevor from the sideline comes and tackles the front row of nurses. You see his massive body barrel them over as you have a respite, a space around you. And you see Dr. Glass step around one of the corners. And you see Dr. Glass step around another one of the corners. Multiple of her. I can help you, Esther. Esper has to try and fight through the nurses, and as she starts to swing, she's calling out to Trevor. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's not right. It's not real. I swear it's different. Sure. Feels real. Uh, As he's holding them back, uh, he's just trying to back off slightly. Like, Trevor is a creature of instinct, first and foremost. If he can get even within arm's reach, he's going to extend his hand to try and grab onto her. Let, Let me help you, help you so that they'll listen to me. Everyone, Everyone listens, listens to me one, one way or another. Esper, you hate Dr. Faust and his cronies. And this person who's meant to be close to you is here egging them on, almost mocking her ability to end it all right now. What is it? What problem do you have with Dr. Glass? As you attack these nurses. Just another fucking doctor who wants to use me. I can't get away from any of you. As Trevor, you have one more chance to help Esper in any way you can. What would you like to do? I don't want to hurt you, Doc. But I will. I will. And Trevor hears in his mind, Get out of here, Trevor. But you're never getting out of here, remember? You're dying here. That's why you listen to me and follow me and do whatever I need you to do. That's the best you've got, isn't it? Just be a good boy and help me out, and afterwards maybe I can find a biscuit tin for you to open. Won't that be nice? You see, he gasps, uh, looking over at Esper. His vision starts to get blurry. Despite everything 
the sound starts to sort of fade until the only thing that he hears is her voice in his mind and the distant beating of a heart. The catch of him in, in her vision gives her pause. Hey. And she rushes toward him. She tries to reach out and grab up onto his forearm. Trevor! He is going to grab onto her and shove her to the side. She's going to try and hang on. Please roll a contested athletics check, both of you. It's bad. For the sake of uh, context, Trevor is about to charge. And this might be the only thing keeping him from moving forward. A 10. 15. 15. Esper, you're shoved away as you stumble backward over the railing of the bed and onto the bed. Trevor, please roll athletics and Dr. Glass, please roll the other stat. And he's just going to charge straight at her. Marshall Glass, just a bestial roar. And what is that athletics check? That is a 23. That beats a 21. And Dr. Glass is saying out loud as Trevor tackles her. Ah, Trevor. Esper, at this moment, I would like for you to make one more wisdom saving throw with advantage and a plus 10. (sighs) All right, we got this. Come on. That is a 21. And that's with advantage. Yes. And plus 10. Okay. Trevor, you run across the room, tackling Dr. Glass into the floor. Dr. Glass, you never lose consciousness throughout this time. As as all of your clones that are crowding the room all are tackled backwards, this scene erupts into chaos as the building shakes, the walls crack, Dr. Glass here and there, and we'll exit the scene as Esper. First of all, I need you to take 10 points of damage and one point of exhaustion. As Trevor, as you look around, there's nothing left on the floor. There's no building. But Dr. Glass, you were witness to all of this. Uh, To Esper's yells. And from the same place where Trevor was previously standing, where the glass was, so now are you. And Esper's back turned to you. You're no longer under any sort of influence of a spell or or this worst version of yourself that Esper believes you to be. You're just the one who witnessed this. You're you. The last thing I saw before I collapsed was the manifest illness of the psyche of everyone around me. I saw physically Esper's addiction, the the torment of Nihilus' worship. I saw Trevor's pain and fear. I saw everyone's hurt. And right before she collapsed, what she felt, Dr. Glass, most of all, was the failure of a lifetime spent wanting to help and heal people. And she doesn't know what to say. She really doesn't like defending herself. She was raised to not make excuses. She knows no one likes it when she explains why she's done what she's done. She goes up to Esper and stands next to her quietly. I am sorry that I was angry at you. At that strange bee man's house, Esper. 
you. I should know better than that. Seeing Dr. Glassby dejected and apologetic, it takes all but two seconds for the cheeks to flush on Esper and for the eyes to well. And there's a quiver on her lip. Please, don't. I don't need another doctor like that. Don't be that kind of doctor. I'm not your doctor. You know that, don't you? You you wanted to come in. I'm not your doctor. I can't be your doctor. We share a bed. We've fought and killed and died. Almost died together. Uh, I can't be the person a doctor needs to be for you. I'm just a person. I, I would like to call you Isadora instead of Dr. Glass. Yes. Are you, are you okay? How do you mean? Compared to usual? Mostly. I... I really thought it was you that I hit. I thought it was... I... It was too much anger to stop it fast, and, and, and the you was saying all of those things, and I thought it was really you for a while, and I... Well, that is... something... to unpack. Ah. Uh, Perhaps not with me. But. I'm still really sorry I hit what I thought was. Do you want to know why we brought you to the asylum? I don't, I don't like defending myself. Only other option was the capital. The only other option was the capital. We didn't know if you could get help there. But to me... The real reason I didn't want to take you to the capital was that you... You risked your life, your sanity, everything, to turn down a deal with that hunter. You spat in his face and told him you would not bring me to the capital. And I thought it would be an insult to that, to then bring us both there and possibly... I don't know, end of the world. You had a vision about me, and I believe your visions. And yes, I thought I could handle Faust. That was arrogant of me. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I swear, I didn't bring you here for my own goals. Esper has long since climbed atop the, uh, the bed and just dropped to sit on it, making it bounce slightly as they just start to rub at their eyes and they get the tears off their face. I wish I wish I'd known, but I I understand. I I, I don't remember. I don't remember falling asleep. It's not something you do often. That man wants you in the capital. I wish I'd known, but it's not, it isn't your fault that I didn't. Do you like hugs? Are you a a hug person? I don't know the last time I got a hug. I don't know how I feel about them. Should we, should, should we try it? Could I have one? I'm told hugging me is like hugging one of those wire monkeys. In, in experiments, but I'll do what I can. I'm probably like hugging a really pudgy doll. That sounds wonderful. I'm just gonna hop off the bed and move over. <laughs> Third bone lady hug. Small arms out wide gonna come and give Dr. Glass a hug. Squeezing possibly a bit too tight. <laughs> There's something about the air in the room, the ambience the, it's all softer it's 
warm. Trevor, you even feel this standing to the side. It's not this cold, dead asylum, but maybe the way it used to be. A place that actually helped people. And the wind lightly blows outside the building as Dr. Glass and Esper, in their embrace, you feel your consciousness returning in the hallway. And somehow, Glass having been the first as you lay on the floor, and Esper, she too lays on the floor. Somehow your hands have landed upon one another. While this is happening, there is still someone else unconscious. Nihilus and Roland. Roland, you open your eyes, standing behind a pane of glass. Everything else around you is dark, empty space, and you see a stone temple of sorts. It's grand. Must have been very expensive to make, and... I don't know if you've ever been here, because the architecture seems foreign to you. It's dimly lit with braziers. No electric light of any sorts. Very traditional. And sitting in the middle of the room, there is a man tied to a chair, bound and gagged hands tied behind the chair immobile I'm checking through this space and nothing behind me the floor is solid I have an inkling who that person is in the chair I'm instinctively in this dark space I'm reaching for a pickaxe that's probably not there who do you think is in that chair there's only one person I've come to find tonight I think that's my brother. There's something familiar about the person in the chair, but you can't quite place it. They're facing away from you. All you see is just the back of the neck because they're heavily clad in leather armor. But again, this place isn't familiar. How could that possibly be your brother? As you see from a ancient arched doorway three priests emerge one of them looks elderly and wise another looks young and impressionable perhaps but there's one that you immediately recognize in the center of the two Nihilus von Stonen As you walk into the room, you see your expected victim. Well, Nihilus, you've done well all these years. I think it's about time. I think you're absolutely right, Hilda. And I have, haven't I? It's been such an easy road, shall I say. As it always is, on the right path of sorts, says Mooney. Yes. And this man before us, I should explain. He's... A heretic. Yes, a heretic. He's betrayed his masters. And Soros has decided, as the elders have, that his existence is no longer desired. By source. I'm not a soul to be claimed for dust. What a shame. More and more these days. It's the next generation. They have it way too easy, I say. I think we should strike the laws upon the sins, if you ask me. 
Roland, you're behind this glass. Seeing Nihilus, you recognize this may be a time in his past. Nihilus, you are yourself. In the beginning, you're reliving events. As you take a step forward towards the man in the chair and the elder beside you, he takes a ceremonial scimitar. He unsheathes it before you. It's studded with gemstones, regal and expensive. The perfect device to carry out a divine execution. And if you do so, you will be an inquisitor. I, I know what that means. As heretic, of course. Yeah, the, the proper proper education is. <laughs> Not sure that's how we should proceed. Nihilus, this is the way. Path of the Source Testimonium. To be an Inquisitor, you have to be able to carry out his divine will. And that means eliminating heretics. You do want to be an Inquisitor, don't you, Nihilus? I do. All of my life, yes. I've. Ever since I was a little. Boy, as for as I've been a follower, I, I graduated. Oh, priest, I did my exam. It's it's all I must be. But surely we are to re-educate this heretic, set on the right path. I... Soros has decided. If it were possible to re-educate, then. We wouldn't be here today. Take the scimitar, Nihilus, as he hands it to you, pushing it against your chest. Takes a couple of steps forwards as his breath starts to come shallow and tremble. He tries to think aloud. He says, Saurus, I pray to you. I know your teachings study them all my life. They are to be true. They are to be followed. They are what teaches us between good and evil, what is right and wrong. This, this man is a heretic. He sinned. He's done you wrong, done not all of us wrong, done the path wrong. Were he to be set free? Were he to be let loose? Were he to continue on this plane, on this world? He'll be like a cancer to infect all others. That's why I pray to you. Take this soul. And take it to hell. Roland, you notice the back of the boot scuffed where you had previously accidentally swung a pickaxe and narrowly took your brother's foot off with it, but you missed. Nihilus, however, hasn't. The blade enters and Nihilus, are you feeling any doubt in this moment? There's not a single fiber in his body except for the tongue that seemingly moves abruptly. That is without any doubt. He is immensely doubting everything he has lived so far. Every moment he has trained, everything. This is, is, is this really it? Is this, is this what I trained for? Is this what we're gonna do? Gonna, what we're gonna kill? Is this, must be an inquisitor. I, my mother is sick. I must. Yeah, I, I must do this for my family. I must become a man. I must set my place in the history books. Uh, you're out. The point where that blade entered what he thought was brother Roland's now checking this glass. He's reaching for a piton and a hammer and he's going to a corner of the glass. He's going to find a weak spot. 
and he wants to as quietly as possible start smacking through the hole just enough that he can get through into that room. <laughs> he's trying to do this quietly, but he's doing this now with force. He's coming in with, we know where to break weak spots to get through to places on the other side. You take this pick and hammer and you know subtlety above all as I'd like for you to roll sleight of hand to disadvantage just straight roll 25 immediately a crack propagates shooting from one corner to the other this is a fault line You've hit the hammer in the right spot. You were able to split the crystal structure of that glass. And one more careful hit will easily send it shattered as Nihilus. What was your wisdom saving throw? 24. As you struck the blade and pulled it up, as the head of this body fell off, tumbled onto its lap, and then onto the floor... The head is your own. You see yourself, eyes open, looking up at you. In this moment, you realize this is a message. You have one chance to say something to yourself. He takes a look around. He has the feeling that he has the wisdom whatever he's going to say will not be audible to anyone else as he looks into his own eyes quite beautifully so uh, he looks into his own eyes and are you the one that I was you the one I will become I don't know myself anymore I didn't start this way I swear I, I, I made an oath I made a vow and sometimes sacrifices have to be made it, what a great group. I promise. You look up, and Roland, through the pane of glass, is looking back at you as he strikes the second time, shattering the glass. The priests are gone, the room is empty, and Roland, as you step forward, you see this wasn't your brother after all. But you see Nihilus. The hell is going on here? <laughs> You, you're not supposed to be here, Broden, but this is... What is going on? Ah, focus. Look, um, we were just... What happened to time? We were... What are the... Prison will be just a moment ago. I was ago, forever ago. Uh... As soon as you say Waterdeep Prison... The floor, as you look down, is the floor of the hallway, but you're still in that room. What else are you recounting? Focus, Roland. You're not making any sense. This whole place doesn't make sense. Are you seeing this? Remember where we were. Remember what we were doing. Focus your intent. This this will be trucked. There's something mechanic going on. Something's fiddling with our minds. Focus, Roland. Uh, And he will cast the command spell on Roland, and he will say the word... Focus. Roland, you don't have to contest it. It's up to you. He will. As you do so, the walls form, the ceiling forms. You're in a hallway as only Nihilus. You open your eyes as you tumbled yourself into the wall. You're leaning up. You look around and you see everybody on the floor... Dr. Glass and Esper just starting to come to and stir on the ground. You see the door to the room is open and you see Sam Van Thorn sitting on the ground with his hand on the skull as we will for a moment go somewhere else. Trevor. That moment where Esper and Dr. Glass connected that moment disappeared without you 
Trevor. You see Eirik. You're standing in his temple. The same one where you, with help, slayed him. Well, he slayed himself, kind of, but who's counting? Roland, that scene with Nihilus, it disappears before you. You're left alone in a dark void. But yet again, you appear behind a pane of glass. Suddenly it starts to come to you. Whatever you did for Nihilus, it seemed to have freed him from this moment being stuck. You opened the door, some might say. And once again, you're seeing as Trevor stands at one end of a room made of bones. The chandelier, the wall, the ceiling, the altar. And you see Dr. Glass standing over Eirik, holding a book. Trevor, what do you do? As Dr. Glass looks back at you, Eirik still alive on the floor. No ritual cast yet, you just see Valadin's body on the floor in the corner where he fell for the first time. He's been in so many places all at once, but he knows this place, even though it might not be exactly... He remembers the situation, he remembers the the emotion, and that's what's important. He feels the adrenaline rush of a fight just finished, the anticipation of something else starting. He knows what's going to happen, and that adrenaline that fueled him before is going to have to keep going. He looks down the hall and just says, Doctor! You... What? I I can't let you do that. Dr. Glass, just as last time, this is the worst version of yourself, the one that Trevor has come to know in this moment. This is somebody who did something that Trevor didn't find tasteful. And behind you, Trevor, Nihilus emerges as well. Nihilus and Dr. Glass, it is your goal to enact the ritual. I think at first, the only difference from what actually happened, because things happen so quickly, is that Trevor gets an eye roll from Dr. Glass before she returns her attention to Nihilus. No, 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 no. He kind of mutters under his breath as he just starts to break off into a full sprint uh, down the hall. And perhaps in this version, she doesn't even wait for uh, advice from Nihilus. She's just already incanting. Excellent, Dr. Glass. We shall proceed. No. Hey, that's... This ain't right. Get up, Trevor. Invitari incantatum irremabo. Hey, hey. Uh, he's gonna leap into the air, land in front. He's going to try and grab the book as best he can, and he's just gonna say, this ain't right. You know this ain't right, okay? You're, you're better than this. Trevor, you don't know what you're doing. Trust us. Trevor, leave this to the people who know what they're doing. You're going to cause some catastrophe. No. I've been thinking about this for a while. This is still a person. He's the, the dead deserve something more than to just move on to something, something else. Whatever this void is, it's not worth the people that you're sacrificing to let it happen. Come on, you're still a person. You still have a heart. He's a cadaver, Trevor. Please roll wisdom with disadvantage, Trevor. And Roland, you see this happening. What are you doing? I'm judging by this point that that version of Nihilus looks a little different. There's a little more cockiness and arrogance to this one. The for now, I'm trying to find 
that same weak spot again and see if it goes in the same place or if I can get through again as subtle as I was. I don't want to. I want to try and find a moment to break in. I want to find. I want to get in and then I want to find a moment to interrupt because I don't know what's about to happen. Please roll sleight of hand as you did last time. That is a twenty-seven for a natural twenty. What the fuck? Hell yes. <laughs> natural 20 as you strike this glass the crack propagates you've done this before you know it very well and with just a little bit more force it comes immediately shattering down Trevor what was that wisdom saving throw the wisdom saving throw was a 5 you're embroiled in this scene as Dr. Glass gets halfway through as Valadin's body begins rising from the ground Roland, you have entered. Now, with his hand off the book, he's now looking up, seeing Valadin's body starting to rise. We've been together for months. That's not a person, Trevor. I I know I ain't the smartest. I know that. That's some crackpot's overgrown toy and poorly made. Some of us count more than others, Trevor. Carry on, Nihilus. You spend so long in the books that you forgot what people do. All right? You... This search for, for answers, you're not going to find it here. Even if you did, even if you did, what does it matter if you just kill someone to find out, right? Life's got to mean more than that. It has to. Listen here, Trevor. It doesn't matter what I say to you. You don't have to comprehension in order to understand anyway. You are blind to the truth, as he says blind, from the red testimony inside of Dr. Glass's hand. This is a green aquatic lance that jumps out and shoots towards the eyes of Trevor as he will cast blindness. What's the save on that? Constitution saving throw. I don't have a good history with con saves. Uh, that is a six. It's immediately lights out, as I'd like for you to roll a wisdom saving throw with advantage before you react. That is a 17. Still embroiled, everything goes dark. You know approximately where you are. You know Valadin is just to the just behind you to the left. You know Dr. Glass at the front near the altar holds the book and casts this ritual. You know Nihilus is behind you. What do you do? I think I'm just some caveman scared of fire, ain't you? All you learned folk sit back in your office and talk down to me all the time. Complacent, huh? Well, do you expect what happens when the person ain't behind the door anymore, when he's right in front of you? When you don't have to use your words to make a difference, sometimes your hands can do the rest, and he's going to lunge at Glass's throat with his hands. Can I intercept him? Please roll a contested athletics. Can I do acrobatics as I'm trying to, to move fast? Or would it... I'd say acrobatics is definitely viable here. That's a 13. That is uh, a 22 for Trevor's athletics. You're not sure what it is you just ran through, but somebody just got barreled to the side as you run towards Dr. Glass, and I'd like one more contested check. Dr. Glass with your other stat. And Trevor, with athletics, please. 16. That is a natural 20 for a 29. Whoa. Honestly, in this moment, Trevor... Every emotion you felt during the first time that this happened rushes back towards you. You were blinded before as well. Your autonomy taken from you before you were taken and abducted to a place you didn't want to be. And all of this rage and emotion pours into you as you run towards Dr. Glass. What do you yell and how do you want to do it? As he collides with Glass, um, he's now just operating completely by feel as... The hand is frothing at the mouth, uh, reaches the face, and then just goes down to the neck and just starts to strangle her. 
as he just says, all my life I've been telling, people have been telling me I'm useless, huh? People have been talking lots, talking a whole lot. Fucking now. Fucking now. And he's just squeezing the life and just trying to straight up kill her. Trevor, this isn't real. Well, where the fuck we are, but this is not real. Concentrate on my voice. Trevor, I'd like for you to roll that wisdom saving throw again with advantage and plus 10. That is a 31. Trevor, your, your sight returns to you as you're standing in this room and Nihilus and Dr. Glass, you witnessed all of that. You heard what he yelled. You understood his pain. Are you with us, Trevor? Calm down. Look at me. <laughs> He's breathing so heavily it's ragged. need to break out of whatever we're in. I've just watched Nihilus break out of this. You need to get out of this. I don't know where we are, how to do it. But whatever bond you guys have, you need to use it. Let's go of the throat. And still blind. He just falls to the side onto his back. He's just two blank eyes looking up at the ceiling. Just goes... <laughs> Why? Why can't I do anything? Everything is just so much. I can't. I can't do anything. He just turns his head over in your direction, Roland. Um. <coughs> I got nothing left. I got no family. My the person I can trust. I don't even. I don't even know what to believe. My own eyes. I'm just. Trevor, you might not know yourself, but I know you. Remember on the whole Royal Rose when we were stuck together? I've, I've seen pain. And I, I understand. Feel you, Trevor. I'm sorry you feel lost. I really, I really do. I know what that's like. I know that feeling. But you're not lost. You're new. You're Trevor. I, I'm here with you. We go through this together. I won't fail you. And he will come closer and put his hand on your shoulder. Trevor, who's the only person you can trust? I don't... It's you. It's you. That's it. Ain't that the saddest fucking thing you ever heard? That's... What does it all mean? What's it gonna mean? When I'm gone, and I'm gonna be gone... There ain't gonna be no God taking my soul, Nihilus. There ain't gonna be no, no afterlife, no, no relaxing. My soul ain't anyone's but hers. It's, it's not too late. Time hasn't run out for you, Trevor. <laughs> Just a fucking idiot. That's all I am. Listen, okay. I in this place I can't punch my problems away I can't shut it for a moment Trevor that is just a factual lie when we were trapped in the past back at that hotel who was it who got us out it was you when we were stuck in this salt waste who was it taking the lead it was you Trevor You've been the rock 
in all steamed adventures of failure. You've been the one leading us. You've been the one holding us all together. I am not sure if you realize it yet, but we might have our wits. We might have our studies. We might have our expertise and whatnot. But whoever speaks the loudest with the most truest of factual words, that is you, Trevor. Your words have the highest of meaning out of everyone in this party because you actually know what life's about. You actually know what to do and what, even if you don't know, you simply say it. Hey, I don't know. It's such a stupid, simple thing that actually works. We try to have all reasons. We try to say whatever comes up across our mind, whatever, what not. I trust you, whether you trust me or not. That is how I feel. And I think you are a wonderful person, Trevor. And I'm sorry you're feeling as lost as you are right now. Fuck this kind of magic or drugs or whatever is happening to us right now. You are you, Trevor. And you're an amazing person. <sighs> you're you. And you're amazing. <sighs> it just. I just want it to matter. I've had five years to reckon with the fact that I'm going to die. I ain't scared of it no more. I just want what comes before that. I just want it to matter. The floors and the walls gently start to recognize as the hallway, as... Trevor, you somehow manage to fall in a way that you keep yourself propped, leaning in the corner. You see as the wave of people starts to come to, rustling in the ground. You see Nihilus brush himself off as he stands. Esper and Glass stand as well. As Roland, this has never been your family your fight. These are people who whose bonds extend long before you and may extend long after. There's only one person who you're here for. Only one bond that matters, really. And as everybody else disappears as this temple of bone shifts yet again almost like whisking you to another place you you take a few steps forward as bone turns to void turns to rock and rubble and dirt you hear the distant Matter of horse hooves and carriages. These animals who are crammed into a small elevator and brought thousands of feet down underground. You hear the pull of different machines, the whir, the rhythmic whir of these grotesque mechanisms that have been created to dig deeper. And as you continue to walk, as the world changes around you to the mines that are under the citadel, you see in the distance the braziers that light up the wall all the way across as 20 or 30 different workers toil away, striking their pickaxes into the wall. You see your brother. Now, I'd like for you to tell us who you know your brother to be. Who you know yourself to be when you used to work in the mines. Mines was always my brother's thing. To him, it was that resource, that underpinning of the society that we were brought and raised in. One of the minor houses, we didn't get 
too much involved in the politics. We weren't there with the Van Fawns. We didn't deal with that side of things, but we had some influence. But he wanted to get involved. He wanted to give back. Always so well-meaning, my brother. Good heart, but maybe the tutors weren't quite as um, diligent when they did the studies for him. He'd already gone to the mines before the time we'd started. At that point, it was... Someone had to go after him. Good work down there. They're all good folk. As I walk past and see the people I nod to, those I recognise. Built up bonds over these last few years here, but... He leads from the front. But he's not a speaker. And he has a habit of sticking his mouth in where it shouldn't happen. And before you were locked up, what happened? How did how did you even end up here in the first place? Stories we read as children. Grand victors, the ones who brought all the evil overlords to their knees. That was the thing, we saw what was happening underneath and we saw the difference on the surface. As the saturations grew heavier, more often, we went back to those stories from our childhood and it's like, we could raise things up, Roland, he'd say. Told him he was joking. Bull's errand. So that our stint, done our part, head back to the family house. Now we can really push for this. Or you know it, Foreman's walking past at just the wrong time. Gets the whip out. No one's laid a hand on my brother. That's not happening. Or you know it, we've got two dozen workers surrounding half dozen guards, and our blood axes have got pit blood on them. We laid them down. That was it then. Tunnels two, three, four, shut down. No work happening. Nothing going through. Then they sent the armed guard, the real ones. And I can't help but think, because it was me who led them all. Well, there was more than six coffins they took out that day. And every single one of them, I think, is up my blood on. They did the ringleaders, then. Yours truly, and him. Made an example of. Oh, look to the society, said the ringleaders. Sorry that your supplies were delayed. God damn, my brother. Best intentions, and we all know where those lead. It's a memory you walk through. You see your brother pulled down from the soapbox that he stands on that he professes from. You see the whip come out the striking happening in the distance you see yourself running to his aid swinging the first strike as all of the heads of the miners turn paying careful attention because few dare to step up in this way you see this all play out history there's a knot in your throat you feel your stomach drop because you will never forget not just the elite guards that came that day. From where you're standing, as you turn your head, you see the one in the front. You'll never forget it. The leather, weathered boots, the straps going up his body, the graffitied water stalker helmet that hung from his side. The other guards, they had to walk. And even though you see him moving the same way that they do, moving his arms and limbs the same way that they do, you can't help but think that he's not walking. You turn back and you see your brother and yourself and a mine full of people 
getting ready to defend themselves. As one of the miners standing next to you, he goes crazy. His eyes go crazy. He swings his axe into the other one next to him. Two more to your right begin fighting, grabbing at each other, gouging at each other's eyes, fighting for their lives. Dispatching of the guards in this mine, that was one thing. But you stood no chance against this one as we will return to this in the next session. Thank you for listening to today's session. I'm Wesley, the Dungeon Master, and I just want to come in at the end to let you know that I'm so glad that you made it here. If you liked it, please consider liking and sharing because as a small channel, that is the bread and butter of how we can be seen by more people. Also, let us know in the comments what you liked. I respond to every single one because I love talking about this stuff. And if you want to support us more, consider donating on Patreon. We have a small $5 tier. It's mostly ceremonial, but you do get access to a lot of behind-the-scenes content and early access to new productions and new ideas and concepts that we think are going to be great when translating to the TTRPG space to make the cinematic style of gameplay. Now stick around to hear the trailer from the Emerald Collective. The Emerald Collective is a group of TTRPG streamers who play games several times a week over on our channel on Twitch. Whether tuning in live or catching up on video on demand, you are sure to be enthralled by our fantastic stories and get sucked into the wonderful worlds we create between our GMs and our regular cast of players. Join an active, growing community of fellow nerds, including the streamers ourselves, on our Discord server. All links can be found at linktree slash Emerald Collective Podcast. And keep an eye out for the Emerald Collection Patreon, launching on May 1st, where every month you'll get original monsters, magic items, maps, and more. Even the free tier gets an occasional bonus. We look forward to seeing you in the chat very soon. Alright, I think we got it, lads. Here I use the Eva Dutch piece, Jungle Combat. No, I didn't use the visuals. Because this is for a podcast, so there are no visuals. Yes, we'll still have them on stream. No, I didn't mention the puns. I don't want to scare off potential viewers too quickly.